So the Edict of Toleration promulgated in the year 313 under now Emperor of the Western Roman Emperor Empire, Constantine. Edict of Toleration 313 CE, also referred to as the Edict of Milan, because the previous Emperor Diocletian, part of his administrative reforms throughout the empire was to move the imperial court, the bureaucracy of uh, court hearings, etc., from Rome to the north, to the city of Mediolanum in Latin, or Milano in Italian, Milan or Milan, if you're in the UK, Milano, Mediolanum, Milan. So that's where it happened, but its real title at the time, it's, it's the Edict of Toleration. Secondly, often mischaracterized as the legalization of Christianity. Mischaracterized. Why? Because this edict did render, did make, under Roman law now, finally for the first time since the year 81 CE, under Emperor Domitian, a legal religion. But that was only de facto we say, from the fact of something else. Whence comes the title of the edict, Edict of Toleration. What this edict did was to legalize all, and this is even more interesting, in the document itself in Latin, what is referred to as superstitione superstitions in English. In other, words, in other words, it legalized all religious cults in the Roman Empire, which de facto legalized the Christian cult. So yes, it did legalize Christianity, but it's not merely the legalize, legalization of Christianity, rather something more important, especially in our contemporary world. This is the first time anywhere, another, you may even call it a contribution. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's a significant. This is the first time in human history, as far as we know, that the idea of religious toleration, hence the name of the edict of toleration, religious toleration and freedom is introduced. You're free to worship whichever flying spaghetti monster you like. That's fine. It would not last long. Significant historically because it's the introduction for the first time in human history of the idea of a state formally recognizing religious freedom, toleration. But it would not last the century. Before the end of the fourth century, it would be superseded and... Uh, relegated to um, the annals of history until the 18th century on the other side of the world in a place called the United States of America. All right, we have a ways to go before we get there and to see how other things develop that will eventually lead to that. So Constantine does not make Christianity the official state religion. That also will happen before the end of the same century, the fourth century. However, he does heavily promote, intentionally, the Christian cult throughout the Roman Empire. And he does so primarily by calling what will become the first of as of today, 2020, 21 ecumenical councils in the history of Christianity, in the history of the church. Ecumenical, from another Greek word, oikumene, uh, kind of like katholika, meaning universal. So a universal council, which will call together all leaders, bishops, Christian bishops, <clears throat> other subordinates of them, like 
priests, deacons, laymen, uh, sorry, no women, but laymen, as in laymen, non-ordained, but men nonetheless, right, to converge and meet <clears throat> to figure out exactly what the hell their religion is all about. Uh, because if we're going to promote this particular religious cult, we should probably make sure everyone is on the same page, that is Christians, in terms of at least basic fundamental tenets. By the way, it's not a tenant, not T-E-N-A-N-T. -N -N that is someone who resides in an apartment building, a tenant, someone who is a landlord that rents from someone a place to live or work. Not a tenant, a tenet, T-E-N-E-T, -E -E something that is held like a belief, a doctrine, a position that is held, a tenet. Okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> in any event, we got to make sure Christians throughout the Roman Empire are all on the same page as to whatever it is they believe and profess. Okay. Secondly, why does Constantine call this? That is, how is it that Constantine calls this first ecumenical council? How is it that Constantine actually has the responsibility and obligation to call such a council? You already know the answer. Critically think. What office, what title, which title and office does Constantine hold that would make him responsible for doing such a thing? Pontifex Maximus. Okay. So, he does this the year after he winds up becoming the emperor of the entire Roman Empire. The year 325. 325, the previous year, Constantine, in a series of battles, defeats the, at the time, Eastern Roman Empire and basically destroys the vision that his predecessor, Emperor Diocletian, had had. That is, moving from what the first emperor, Caesar Augustus, called a princeps, right? A prince, first among inquels, primus inter pares, first among inquels, Princeps, the prince of those first among equals, Diocletian turned it into what historians refer to as a tetrarchy, ruled by four. An emperor in the west with a vice called the Caesar, Caesar. Emperor in the east called, uh, well actually the emperor in the east was the emperor, the emperor in the west was called the Augustus. Under each of them they had a vice, which they called the Caesar. So ruled by four, four guys. East, west, two guys. Under them, two guys. Four. Ruled by four, tetrarchy. Very short-lived, only a few decades, because of Constantine, who maintained the Eastern and Western blend, as well as the Caesars, but it was obvious that he was moving to a reconsolidation of power back into the hands of one. And at this time, it's Constantine. Okay. <clears throat> so the year after, 325, he calls the first ecumenical council. It's held in a suburb, a small town outside of the new capital city, a town by the name of Nicaea, N-I-C-A-E-A, -E Nicaea, Nicaea, as in the Nicene Creed, if you've ever heard of that, this is where that comes from. Nicaea, the first council of Nicaea, or Nicaea I, in the year 325. And for our purposes, this council uh, does the following things. First, number one, this is the first time in Christianity that the canon, <coughs> excuse me, C-A-N-O-N, <coughs> canon, from a Greek word, kanon, K-A-N-O-N, meaning rule, like a ruler, measuring rod, Anything that falls within that measuring rod or ruler is considered canonical or legal, legitimate, okay? The canon of the New Testament, 27 books. So when does Christianity formally recognize 
what we today refer to as the New Testament, 27 books, the First Council of Nicaea, 325. Number two, for the first time since Jesus rose from the dead and 40 days later ascended into heaven, uh, for the first time since then, so almost three centuries later, the Christians finally formalize the date when they will actually celebrate that, that is Easter up until this point, depending on where you were in the Roman Empire, if you were a Christian, you were celebrating Easter on one of two different dates, following two different traditions. One referred to as the Quarto Deciman tradition, the other referred to as the Lunar tradition, Quarto Deciman, as in the Latin term for 14 as in the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, with one S, so not, you know, an automobile. <laughs> the name in Hebrew of the month, which in English corresponds to April, the 14th day of the month of Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, April. This tradition celebrated Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, on the same day, same exact precise day every year, the 14th day of the month of Nisan, because as the calendars calculated, it was that particular day when Sunday, the resurrection day of Jesus Christ occurred back in whatever, 27 CE, 33 CE, whenever it happened. In other words, if you were doing following that tradition as a Christian, Every year you were celebrating Easter, not on Sunday, but on some other day of the week. The other tradition, the lunar tradition, celebrated was celebrating Easter on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the spring equinox, the lunar tradition. Celebrate Easter always on Sunday, but it's always the first Sunday following the first full moon following the spring equinox. The vernal equinox is set, by the way, Phys March 20, 21, okay, 20th, 21st, right. Which one do you think won out? The lunar tradition, if you're at all familiar with not just Easter, but Easter, but even Passover, the Jewish Hebrew feast of Passover, that's why every year the date of Easter changes. Because at the first council of Nicaea under Emperor Constantine, who's Pontifex Maximus, the year 325, this is when they say, Quarto Decimon tradition, half of you Christians are celebrating Easter, the resurrection of our God, on the wrong day. So fall in line. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, it's also at this first council of Nicaea, 325, when the, what well, today is referred to as canon law, again, canon, rule, measure, right? Everything within that rule, measuring rod, is legitimate, licit, legal law. So church law is called canon law. This is when it's first introduced, and it's done so by introducing no less than 20 canons, individual laws, of which two are of particular interest for us, a bit gratuitously titillating, I will admit, but I suggest these two in particular not to be gratuitous and titillating, but because it'll help you to actually continue to think critically about what's really going on here. Two canons, two laws in particular. One uh, is a prohibition of clergy, that is, ordained ministers, bishops, priests, deacons, is a prohibition 
of clergy engaging in the practice of usury. Usury. U-S-U-R-Y. Usury. Uh, it, it means loan sharking. Loan sharking. Giving someone a loan and requiring an exorbitant amount of interest on top of that loan back when it's finally repaid. Loan sharking. The vague. Okay. The second thing is a prohibition, uh, not just among the ordained, though it probably wasn't a problem for them as much as it was for lay men. A prohibition on the practice of um, self castration. Do it yourself <laughs> or connect me. Gelding, self castration. <clears throat> that is cutting off your balls physically, which in ancient Rome was usually done with muscle shells. Uh, linguini alle cozze. So, like a pasta dish with mussels. Delicious. Muscle shells. Uh, are razor sharp and that's how they did it in ancient Rome if you were into that thing so they uh, they made that illegal <laughs> all jokes aside the important takeaway here is think about this if such laws are considered necessary enough to be introduced as laws, that means that these practices, priests loan sharking and others cutting off their balls, must have been a rather prevalent practice among Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Okay. <clears throat> Finally, and this is really the most important, uh, for reasons we'll continue to see develop in uh, other lecture sessions, is the big debate, the major debate that was going on at the time and had been going on for about 100 years. Not the baptismal controversy, which we've already covered, which is interesting. Rather, the debate between something referred to as Arianism, or Aryan Christianity and what would forever after be remembered as Nicene Christianity. Aryan Christianity, Arianism, not with a Y, but with an I. A R I A N, Arian, named after one of its, at the time of the First Council of Nicaea 325, major proponents from Egypt a priest by the name of Arius, A-R-I-U-S. And quite simply and basically, it suggested that Jesus Christ, going back in the New Testament, Gospel of John, when we say Jesus Christ, do we mean Jesus Christ is fully divine? Son of God? God? Or do we mean the demigod, demigod, right? Superman, faster than a speeding bullet, can walk on water, raise the dead, but not God. Okay. The Arian position, Arian Christianity proposed that Jesus Christ is a demigod. There were roughly 300 bishops, priests, and laymen, theologians present at this first council of Nicaea in the year 325. To begin with, which position do you think was the majority position? That is, Jesus Christ is fully divine, Son of God, or kind of like a superhero, demigod? The Arian position, Christ is demigod, or the Nicene position, 
Christ is fully divine. Well, you're probably going to say, well, if it's called the Nicene position, that must have mean that is Jesus Christ is fully divine. Well, that must mean they won, and therefore that was the majority, right? Wrong. <clears throat> no less than about 90%, let's say 80%, 70%, it's really 90% of the participants, the members at this council, <clears throat> were of the Arian position. That is to say that Jesus Christ is a demigod, not fully divine. Only about 10% were of the position that, no, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, fully divine. That is based on the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. Jesus Christ is the Christ, and moreover, the Son of the living God, fully divine. <clears throat> Which way did the council vote? Now you guessed right. It's called the Nicene position, yeah. It voted in favor of the minority, the overwhelming or underwhelming minority position that Jesus Christ is fully divine. How in the world did that happen? We said that Constantine <clears throat> had the obligation, the responsibility to convene this ecumenical council because Constantine, not because Constantine was emperor, but because Constantine was the Pontifex Maximus. Constantine presided, which is another formal legal mechanism in Roman law, so it means a lot. Right? He's presiding. But Constantine did not vote at the council. Only the designated Christian bishops voted. <clears throat> How is it that the overwhelming majority lost the vote? Well, one position is that they were suddenly over... They were slain in the spirit. Divine inspiration. It just came over them in a flash. Oh, wow. How could 90% of us have been so wrong for 250 years? Of course Jesus Christ is fully divine. They were inspired suddenly by a waft of odor, perfumed, albeit, <clears throat> of the Holy Ghost. So that, that's one explanation. Another explanation could be this. Uh, Emperor Constantine is sitting there among all these Christian bishops, right? These Christian bishops know that Constantine is the emperor and Pontifex Maximus, and he has only recently made theirs a legal religion. Maybe it would be nice before we vote to find out what Emperor Constantine thinks what he would like. And indeed, what would Emperor Constantine like? I ask you, what do you think? If you were Emperor Constantine, which position would you prefer? The Arian position, Jesus Christ is a demigod, or the Nicene position, Jesus Christ is fully divine? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> if Constantine goes with the Arian position... Jesus Christ is merely a demigod. What happens if tomorrow a would-be pretender to my throne comes along and says, ah, well, actually, my God is fully divine. In other words, my God beats your God. I win. Maybe it's better that my God already is fully divine. That may seem simplistic and prime ignorant to us today, but trust me, it was not in the 4th century. Constant, uh, consequently, the Council, the First Council of Nicaea through 25, votes that Jesus Christ is fully divine. Son of God is God. And the 
theological uh, explanation given for this, to justify this, is that Jesus Christ is fully divine because why? Because the second person of the Trinity, the Son, Jesus Christ, is in Greek, homoousios, H-O-M-O, homo, ousios, O-U-S-I-O-S, homoousios in Greek, consubstantia in Latin. In English, well, consubstantial, what the hell does that mean? One in being, that the Son, second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, is one in being with the Father, first person of the Trinity. Well, if the Father is fully divine and the Son, second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, is one in being with the Father, then that necessarily means that the Son is fully divine, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. So that is uh, the formula, right? The forma, the form. Uh, that was the theological explanation, which remains part of the then, forever after, known as Nicene Creed. Of course, there's later developments we'll come to shortly. With that said, Constantine... <clears throat> We said also uh, heavily promoted the Christian cult throughout the Roman Empire. Constantine himself would not become a Christian. That is, would not be baptized a Christian until about a month before he died. In fact, he was on his deathbed in the year 337. Didn't become a Christian until a month before he died in the year 337. So this is once again 12 years after this first council of Nicaea. Why did he wait so long? Well, if you remember in the third century, Cyprian of Carthage, the Order of Penitents, we still do not have what today among Roman Catholics especially is referred to as the frequent practice and reception of the sacrament of reconciliation, penance, confession. The Order of Penitents was, re penitence was reserved to only those who had cre cre uh, committed grave crimes slash sins like apostasy rejecting jesus christ uh murder to name just a couple emperor constantine the first christian roman emperor he wound up whacking half of his family including some of his own children one of my favorites, and I hope I'm not repeating, I don't know if I mentioned this in another video lecture series. One of my favorites, his son Chrysippus, uh, political intrigue, he thought his son Chrysippus, his, was his name, was betraying him. So he, had, he has Chrysippus tied down, strapped down to a chair, and they put a board behind his back to force him to sort of bend over with his head uh, a bowl of boiling vinegar so that while he suffocated to death, he also went blind. <laughs> That's not only his father doing this to him, but Rome's first Christian emperor, Constantine. Okay. For which Constantine would be immediately excommunio or excommunicated from the Catholic Church and have to go into the order of penitence. So you know what? I'll promote it, but I'm going to hold off because... I got some business <laughs> to take care of first. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, Constantine, in the end, when he is baptized on his deathbed, he chooses a Christian bishop by the name of Eusebius Eusebius of Nicomedia. Nicomedia. Not Caesarea Caesarea, who was a Nicene Christian bishop and his court historian, but another Eusebius, Christian bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia, who was not a Nicene Christian bishop. 
he was still a holder on to Arianism, to Arian Christianity. <clears throat> Why in the world would Constantine choose an Arian bishop to baptize him a Christian? Hold that thought for the next lecture session.